Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. Good day to everybody. Uh, this is Nicholas Bornolis of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to Capital Link's uh, corporate presentation series. We have with us today the management of Synergy Maritime Holdings, Mr. Stamatis Chantanis, the CEO, and Mr. Stavros Liftakis, the CFO. Uh, a quick reminder on the uh, disclaimer that uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and it is not an offer to buy or sell any securities. It's just for information purposes. Uh, in terms of logistics, we start with the presentation, a slide presentation. After the presentation, uh, management will be responding to questions that you can submit uh, during this presentation by clicking on the button uh, on your screen below, the Q&A button. Please submit your questions and uh, uh, Stamatis and uh, Stavros will be uh, responding to them. And with this, I will turn the floor over to uh, Stamatis and uh, Stavros. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining our presentation today. My name is uh, Stamatis Santanis and I'm the chairman and CEO of Synergy Maritime Holdings. Together with me on my left is Mr. Stavros Giftaikis, the company's chief financial officer. And the purpose of today's uh, presentation is to go through the highlights uh, of the company, have some brief uh, financial discussion and save time at the end for Q&A uh, and make it as uh, useful as possible. So on that note, I would like uh, Annie of Capital Link uh, to start the presentation so you can, uh, we can go through the slides. Thank you. That's uh, the uh, first page of the presentation. If we can move to uh, page number four, please. Thank you. This is great. So a few words about Synergy Maritime Holdings. Uh, Synergy is the only US listed company with a pure play Cape size fleet. We have been listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange since 2008, and uh, we have a modern high quality fleet of pure play Cape size vessels. We are a very experienced uh, management team, young and experienced management team. We have a very solid corporate governance and a fundamental focus on ESG. Long-standing commercial relationships uh, with some of the world's largest charters that I will discuss later in today's presentation. And we have all, uh, all, all, all of our vessels are actually operating in period contracts. And we have the lowest book value uh, of the fleet uh, as relates to the dead weight uh, capacity. So we, that means that we have bought our ships cheaper than most of our, if not all of our peers. What I must say here is that we are an independent company. We have no sponsored ownership and we have no affiliations with private equities or hedge funds. That means that uh, our interests are fully aligned with all the shareholders' interests and we have no business on the side making fees like private companies or things like that. So we're a truly independent company with a very transparent corporate structure. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Here we have a short infographic uh, that we have on the website for ease of reference. Uh, the key important point here is that the fleet has grown by about 65% over the last two years by investing $259 million in new vessel acquisitions in what we believe to be uh, one of the lowest points of the market. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Here is the fleet list of the company. As you can see, uh, we have a very homogeneous fleet, high quality. All of our vessels have been built in either Japan or South Korea. And all the vessels are operating on period time charters that I mentioned before. We have a combined cargo carrying capacity of 3.2 million deadweight tons, which is a very substantial transportation capacity. And the average age of the fleet is 12.4 years. Moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, here we have a slide that you can uh, review at your own time if you want. Um, we have it on the website. It's a brief uh, history of the company since we relaunched our operations uh, seven years ago in 2015. And it discusses how we have grown our fleet from one vessel to uh, 18 Cape size vessels 
that we have today. Moving on to the next slide. A few words about ourselves. Uh, myself and Stavros, we're a very experienced uh, management team. Uh, but aside from us, we have a great uh, management depth with some uh, high quality professionals that have been with the company for many years. And we believe we have one of the best uh, teams uh, running our vessels and our corporate operations among the industry. Our board of directors, uh, we have five independent, oh, sorry, we have three independent board members, five board members in total, and a combined um, experience of more than 100 years. So it's a, a very combined, a com co combined, it's a very uh, experienced board, as you can see. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, a few words about the rewards that we have uh, given to our shareholders in 2022, and that's a very significant slide here. Uh, in total, we have um, created a value of about $55 million, and that is uh, that consists of a cash dividend, a stock dividend, and buybacks that the company has made in 2022. Starting with the dividend, we have paid the total cash dividend of 12.5 cents per share in 2022. And at the same time, we gave um, stock dividend of the United Maritime shares, which is about 3.2 cents per share. So on a combined basis, we're talking about the 16 uh, cents per share uh, or a 30% dividend yield that we have paid to our shareholders, either in the form of cash, the majority is in the form of cash, or through the distribution of United shares. At the same time, we have bought back $26.7 million of convertible notes, warrants, shares. So we're talking about a very substantial accretion of value and distribution of value to our shareholders, which is in the region of close to $55 million in 2022. Considering the fact that our market cap is about $100 million right now, uh, a very undervalued market cap, you know, uh, creating a $55 million value for our shareholders, I think it's a very, very significant point. Moving on to the next slide, please. A few words about our ESG commitment. Uh, I'm going to start with the fleet and the environmental part of uh, the overall picture here. We are one of the first companies out there that we have installed remote performance monitoring systems since 2015. And in combination with our charters, we are installing uh, energy saving devices on the majority of our vessels, if not all of our vessels. So we strongly believe that our fleet is going to remain highly competitive uh, until 2030, which is a big turning point for the global uh, vessels out there. And uh, we are among uh, the uh, pioneers yeah, in that uh, in that sector. Now we, at the same time, we have very social, very high social sensitivity. So we want to treat our people uh, both at the office as well as at sea with the best possible measures. Uh, we have free internet on board our ships. We have signed the Neptune Declaration, and we try to support uh, our staff no matter where they are with the best possible way. At the same time, from a corporate governance perspective, most importantly, as I said in the beginning, we're a truly independent company. We have no private uh, entities on the side making fees outside of Synergy. We have a truly independent board of directors and we're not a sponsored company or we're not affiliated with any hedge fund or private equity or things like that. So we're talking about a true alignment of interest between management and the shareholders of the company. Moving on to the next slide. And the next one, please. Right, a few words about our clients here. It's a bit of a name dropping. As you can see, we do business with some of the world's largest charters. And we're not talking simply about chartering the ships on a period of employment. We're talking about something deeper, uh, which is effectively uh, installing scrubbers or installing energy saving devices and discussing the future of the ship together with any of these names. So that creates a lot of value because we're all uh, on the same table making decisions about the ship, whether that is called upcoming environmental regulations or new technological equipment that we can install on the ship or a combination of the above, because we're proud to be doing business with some names that are fully open uh, to innovation. And we have been at the forefront of innovation over the last seven years. Moving on to the next slide. Stavros now is going to walk through um, uh, the uh, bank 
relationships of the company and some high level financials. And I will come back to the presentation to discuss uh, the market update. So Stavro, if you want to go ahead. Thank you so much. Good morning also from my side and a big thanks to Nicholas and the Capital League team for hosting our presentation. So on the next slide, uh, slide 13 that is, uh, you can see an overview of our vessel financing and of our lending group. Uh, what is interesting to note uh, in this slide is that basically out of the nine financial institutions that you see here, only three were lending to Synergy 24, 24 months ago. So over the last two years, we have embarked in a very ambitious refinancing and new financing program, uh, which shows concluding facilities of 270 million in total, with the main aim being to reduce uh, the uh, applicable interest rate across all financings and to improve the overall terms, of course, in, uh, in combination with funding the very ambitious uh, fleet uh, growth program. Uh, so through uh, this effort, we have managed to reduce the average spread applicable on our facilities from 5.1% as of the end of 2020 to 2.9% as of the end of last year, uh, which is an impressive reduction of more than 200 basis points. At the same time, we, we have expanded our lending relationships globally, concluding new financings in the prominent Asian market with Chinese, Japanese, and Taiwanese lenders, while also strengthening our relationship uh, with the prominent uh, shipping lenders in Europe. Uh, our total debt stands, our total gross debt stands at around 250 million as of the end of uh, 2022. This includes vested secure debts. It includes also the facility that we concluded uh, at the end of last year for our newest acquisition, the Parachy, and it includes also some remaining convertible notes. Uh, the loan to value uh, across our fleet is based on uh, September valuations is uh, below 50%. Um, and maybe moving on to the next slide, you can see uh, here the deleveraging effect is even more apparent and in combination uh, with uh, our fleet growth. Uh, as you see in the first, uh, in the first graph, we have increased our fleet's cargo carrying capacity. Uh, it, it has almost doubled actually through the last two years. And at the same time, our corporate leverage and fleet loan to value has reduced by almost 50%. This is even more evident when we look at the debt vessels, at the debt figures on a per vessel basis, whereby through the last two years, we have completely eliminated junior debt we have marginalized convertible debt and we have reduced the senior secure debt to almost 50 percent of uh, the average market value uh, of our vessels on the last graph you can see uh, an attestation of the fact that we have bought our ships cheaper than our competition as the book value per dead weight for synergy stands almost at 50% compared to the average of our peers. Moving on to the next slide, a few words uh, about our financials as uh, for the first nine months of 2022. Uh, we had 4,380 operating days increased by 25% compared to next year, to last year as we integrate the additional vessels that we have acquired in our fleet. The time charter equivalent that we achieved was close to 21,000, which is at a premium to what the market, to how the market performed in the same period. Net revenues were close to 100 million, uh, while adjusted net income was close to 22 and a half million. EBITDA and adjusted EBITDA were approximately 50 million which is impressive for a company of the market cap that Samad is discussed below of close to 100 million today. M moving on to the balance sheet, cash and restricted cash uh, stood at around 26 million. This translates to around one and a half million per vessel. Our aim 
is for our liquidity to stand always in between one and a half and two and a half million per ship, which we think that provides a comfortable cushion uh, against adverse movement in the freight rates. Uh, the net book value of our fleet was close to 440 million. The actual market value at that point of the fleet was much higher, closer to 480 million. And the long-term debt, which we have discussed uh, previously extensively at that point was close to 233 million, uh, resulting to an equity position, a book equity position of 225 million. Lastly, on the next slide, please, Annie, we have run some sens sensitivity uh, scenarios and sensitivity analysis on our EBITDA, exhibiting our operating leverage under different rate assumptions. Here you can see that in a market situation like the one that we experienced back in 2021, our EBITDA can reach, can exceed 150 million. And in fact, for every thousand increase in our time charter equivalent, our EBITDA increases by approximately 6 million, which exhibits our tremendous operating leverage. And with that note, I will turn the presentation back to Stamati to discuss a bit the supply and demand fundamentals for our industry. Thank you, Stavro. Thank you. So moving on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit the demand and supply fundamentals and why we believe that uh, this is now a very strong turning point for the KPSI segment. Um, I'm going to start with uh, demand, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you're all aware that China has reopened, and the reopening of China is expected to improve a lot the industrial production, as well as the new incentives to support uh, the very problematic housing market that has been announced recently. At the same time, please note that uh, it's expected that the new coal power plants in Asia uh, by 2025 is going to be, I'm talking about the new ones, 270 gigawatts. So I'm talking about a big supply of uh, power plants that are going to be burning coal, and that's going to help coal demand significantly. Uh, at the same time, uh, everybody believes that the iron ore uh, and coal ton mile is going to decrease over the next uh, two to three years. Um, whether that's going to be more coal or more iron ore or more bauxite, we don't know. But overall, it's projected that it's going to remain stable or increase somewhat over the next uh, few years. So moving on to the next slide, slide 19, that, in my opinion, is the most important uh, point uh, for the market uh, because we are now in uh, the lowest order book point of the last 24 years. So that means that the order book of Cape Size Vessels can stand at the lowest point since the early 2000s and for a number of reasons, uh, not only the financial sense that it doesn't make to build uh, new cape sizes, but at the same time, it's the, um, um, the overall uncertainty about the upcoming environmental regulations. That being said, we don't really expect that picture to change anytime soon. And the existing fleet, which is going to get older and older as the years will pass, will have to either slow down or invest heavily in order to become competitive from now until 2030. So we have to deal pretty much with the existing supply of ships over the next few years, and that's going to have a declining effect, which in our opinion is going to boost demand on a very sustainable basis. Uh, I'm talking about the rates on a very sustainable basis moving forward. So um, demand is going to be what is going to be uh, stable or higher, and we strongly believe that it's going to be higher. But the biggest point here is the supply of ships. And that's the strongest point of the last 20, 24 years. This is not going to turn anytime soon. So the supply, uh, the, the lack of new supply of ships is going to give a very sustainable and prolonged improvement in the rates that we're going to be experiencing uh, in the next few years. On that note, uh, that concludes our presentation and uh, we'll now pass the floor uh, for Q&A. So please go ahead. As a reminder, please submit your questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, Stamatis and uh, Stavros are here to uh, reply to them. Right. So uh, I see a question here that talks about capital allocation ideas for 2023. 
and how we would allocate capital between shareholder rewards, uh, fleet growth, or deleveraging the balance sheet? Well, the answer to this question is that we intend to maintain a very balanced approach. Um, rewarding our shareholders is always a top priority for us, and we will continue doing that in 2023 as well. At the same time, we might be looking at uh, various uh, uh, additional purchases without sacrificing our shareholder uh, returns. And we might as well deliver the company, but we already have a very aggressive um, repayment schedule on our debt. So this is not going to be an issue uh, for leveraging. I mean, the company will have uh, a net loan to value at the end of 2023 of some in the region of 40%, 40%, which is on the very low side. Right, now the next question is actually a very interesting one. Um, and it discusses the compliance with NASDAQ and the minimum bid price. Um, that's a very interesting question because, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> we strongly believe that uh, the stock price of the company is highly undervalued for various reasons. This is not necessarily this does not necessarily have to do with the company, but with the fact that we have seen super large capitalized companies like Tesla, like Apple. Being uh, losing uh, or Meta and all that losing uh, two thirds of their uh, market cap over the last uh, years. So <clears throat> that, uh, in our opinion, can be an issue. It's not an immediate issue, but we might be considering um, some sort of a reverse stock split in the near future. That is going to be highly supported by us. I mean, if we are to consider a reverse stock split that is going to be uh, supported heavily by um, repurchase of shares and uh, my own personal uh, purchase of shares. And that's going to give a very strong confidence to the market because our intention and our strong consideration is to try to break way above the $1 threshold and make the company a marginable um, security going forward. So that's, that's among our considerations right now for us and the board. Um, we're not leaning towards any decision yet, but the minimum bid price is something that we want to consider um, in the next few months, and we will not necessarily going to wait for the passing of the deadline provided to us by NASDAQ. So we try to uh, rip the bandits and resolve this matter better sooner rather than later. <clears throat> Uh, the other question is discussing about the repurchase of classic warrants. Uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, I don't know, did we announce already? We announced yes. this morning. Actually. Yes, we actually announced this morning that we have managed to repurchase about 50% of the outstanding classic warrants. And that, uh, in our opinion, helps uh, cleaning, up, cleaning up the balance sheet a lot and eliminating potential dilution uh, when hopefully the stock price is going to uh, get better. So we're actually buying the warrants at a discount to their exercise price. And that we think is a highly accretive measure for, uh, for our shareholders and cleaning up the balance sheet, um, cleaning up the capital structure quite a lot. Correct, and maybe Stamat, it's interesting to note here that the fact that Every dividend distribution reduces the price mm. of, of the warrants. Has made basically the warrants in the money. So this is looming dilution, which we managed basically we're repurchasing shares at 20 cents. Yes, that, yes. that was it was colossally accretive for our shareholders. Of course, that, that's that's great news. Um, now another discussion is the rationale of the United spin-off. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the rationale behind the United Maritime spin-off is that we want to create a, a vehicle that will have a highly speculative and highly um, gain and distribution effect for our shareholders. We cannot do, do that with Synergy. We have long-standing relationship with our charter, so we cannot be buying and selling ships as quickly as we have managed to achieve that with United Maritime. United Maritime is um, a high growth high return uh, vehicle for our shareholders and we've proven that, but that's a discussion for United. And for Synergy, the rationale is to uh, provide some sort of a dividend to, to our shareholders, which is about three cents per share. And that has been included into the, the overall distribution um, that we discussed before. 
The next question discusses the average cost of capital for the $250 million of debt. So, Stan, what you want to discuss? Yeah, that? of course. As we discussed before, the average spread is in the region of uh, $290 today. Uh, so, base rates are uh, trending at around 4.5%. So, all in, that's, uh, that takes us to around 7.2%. Uh, 7, uh, now I see also that uh, the gentleman here is asking whether we can break it down by fixed and floating rate debt. The majority is floating. We, had a, we have around 50 million in sale and lease box with our, which are of fixed rate. So it's around 20% uh, of, of our debt that is fixed rate debt. Right. Okay, so the next question is the current book value per share. Um, we believe that the current book value per share is at about dollar twenty, dollar thirty. Is it something yeah. like that? Yeah. So the approximate the book value per share uh, is at around dollar twenty, dollar thirty per share. Uh, the next question is about the reopening of China and why do we believe that the reopening of China um, is going to be beneficial for the market? Well, you know, when, when you live in a lockdown for the last three years, pretty much in China, that's not uh, definitely. Uh, very helpful for industrial production and uh, overall uh, housing market and expansion. I mean, if people are living in their own houses, how can they consider buying a new house or things like that? So when you talk about infrastructure investment and the building new houses and industrial production and everything that is going to help the economy to kickstart again and import more and more iron ore and, uh, and uh, coal for the production of steel, the reopening of China is exactly what you need. Now, obviously, uh, any such sudden move like we have experienced uh, cannot be without problems. Yes, everybody or a lot of people in China are experiencing uh, the COVID situation where they, you know, uh, where they didn't have that for the previous years with the zero COVID policy. I believe that once things smoothen out and we pass the Chinese New Year at the end of January, I strongly believe that this is going to be very, very beneficial for um, very beneficial for the market. The next question to discuss about the spin-off of United. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, a, a presentation for Synergy, so I'm not going to get into the United um, story right now. But we're going to have another presentation for United uh, next week, and happy to discuss that. Uh, happy to discuss that uh, next week if you want at the United presentation. Uh, the next question is the sustainability of the dividend. Well, I mean, right now the company has a very low break even, and we believe that uh, we can sustain our dividend in the future. So uh, that's for, for us right now, we, we're not considering anything in respect to the dividend. Um, we have very strong cash flow. As Stavros mentioned before, the EBITDA generation of the company is quite significant, even in a very weak market environment. So, you know, there, there's no discussion about the dividend uh, right now. Uh, another question is about additions and uh, sales of the fleet in uh, 2023. Uh, we expect to remain at pretty much the same levels between, let's say, 16 and 20 ships. Uh, we do not have any crazy aspirations to go up by another 65%. We want to have a balanced approach and a balanced distribution of capital in 2023. Focus on shareholder rewards. And, you know, if we can find quality assets, dispose of the older ones and buy newer ships, uh, with scrubbers, and that's a very important thing that we need to mention here, is that the latest acquisition of the company has a scrubber, so we are benefiting from the scrubber premium. That's pretty much what we have in mind. So stable growth, uh, if I can say, good distribution of capital for our shareholders, and that's pretty much the idea for, um, for, um, for 2023. We have another question about the CII score of our fleet. Uh, well, right now we are at uh, A, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, the majority of the fleet is either A or B. Um, 2023 is going to be um, a testing year for uh, for the fleet. 
So we expect to remain um, compliant with CII. It's all about what kind of speed and transportation capacity we will be putting into place. Uh, it's too soon to tell, but uh, the current score, if I remember well, is either A or B. So we're in pretty good, pretty good shape as far as the CI is concerned. Another question that uh, we want to discuss now is um, the Cape size market once again, and the supply of ships. As I mentioned before, we have the lowest uh, vessel supply of the last 20 plus years. We don't really see that picture changing. Uh, and that is going to give a highly uh, sustainable and strong increase in rates because the fleet growth is going to slow. Uh, the available vessels in the water, the effective supply of ships is going to start declining from 2023, especially in the second half and onwards. And that is going to boost the rates on a highly sustainable basis. Um, and the other question talks about our expectations for the dry index. Once again, we feel that the futures, uh, the FFAs, do not really represent our expectations for the market. So I don't really believe that the uh, calendar 2023 of 13,000 yeah. the, on the FFAs is grossly 14, uh, 14 is grossly understated. I think as a worst case scenario, we're gonna see pretty much the same rates in 23 as we saw in 2022. And on a good case scenario, we can move closer to 30,000. <coughs> but that is going to be a volatile year. We all know that this is gonna be a volatile year. We expect 2023 to be a volatile year. And Synergy is in one of the best positions to capitalize on the, uh, on the upside. The next question is actually a very interesting question that talks about uh, the useful life of our vessels. Well, right now we cannot make any uh, predictions because there is a big turning point in 2030 uh, that a big percentage of the global fleet will not be commercially viable post 2030. From now, which is 2023 until then, we believe that our fleet will rem remain quite competitive uh, that's why we have high quality vessels and that's why we have bought ships uh, at the great average age of around 12 years. So the allocation of capital has been uh, quite successful so far. And we strongly believe that our vessels is going to uh, continue uh, be operational and highly competitive over the next uh, few years. Um, the next question discusses about purchases of uh, visual vessels. Uh, as I said before, we will be buying uh, hopefully ships. We will be selling some of the older tonnets. We expect to maintain a fleet size of anywhere between 16 and 20 vessels um, in 2023. Right now, we are focusing on quality. And by quality, I mean installing and saving devices, install, making sure that uh, we take advantage of the scrubber premium and everything associated with uh, making our, our fleet as uh, high quality as possible to, to and to, as profitable as possible. And that's that's what we have um, that's what we have in mind. On that note, I don't really see any other questions coming up. So if there are no further questions, uh, Nicole and Annie, you know, well, as you can tell, uh, Shamati, we could uh, continue for another hour here. So uh, you got uh, both of you a ton of questions. And uh, thank you very much for uh, this very informative uh, exchange uh, and the presentation of the Q&A. In closing, I would like to remind everybody that uh, this presentation will be archived and available to be accessed upon demand. And I'm sure you will uh, get a lot more um, replace as we did last year so thank before, you before before we go nicolas uh, as a final statement uh, from me and stavros i want to say once again that uh, first of all thank you for organizing uh, today's uh, presentation i think it's a great initiative and it's good to put um in front of so many investors or potential investors uh, quality companies like us uh synergy once again is a, an independent company we're not a sponsored company and we're not 
uh, related to any uh, hedge fund or private equity. We have no um, private business on the side. And having said that, uh, we have a true and absolute alignment of interest between ourselves as management of the company and all of our shareholders. And we're doing the best in order to generate the best possible returns for all of them. That has been evident in 2022 by distributing close to 30% cash and share dividend yield. And we expect to continue creating value and accretion for our shareholders going forward. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. And thank you, Ustamatis and Stavros, of course. Thank you. Thank you.